Good to go. Okay. And I'm going to put my video on just to introduce myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Mitchell. I am with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, also known as EGLE. Um, I am the program manager for EGLE's new septic replacement loan program. So tonight I'm going to be sharing some information about that program, give some programmatic updates. Some of the information in my presentation will be repetitive because all the other presenters have done such a great job at offering great septic um, information. I have my contact info here, so I want to encourage all of you to write that down or this will be shared later. So take a screenshot and reach out if you ever have any questions about the program in the future or any on-site wastewater questions in general. I can at least direct you to the right folks, if not um, able to answer myself. So I'm going to turn my video off while I present, um, but I'm really excited to share with you guys what we're working on. So give me just a second. Oh. I don't know why my slide. There we go. Um, so this looks like a really long agenda. I promise I'm not going to keep us here until 9 p.m. But I'm going to go over a general overview of the program, talk about a program timeline. We're going to talk about some of the general provisions of these loans. I'm going to briefly discuss Michigan Saves and their role in this program. We're going to talk about some loan specifics, the application process. Um, I'm going to offer an update on, on what we've done so far. And then we're going to wrap up. And I think I'm the last one. So then we can answer hopefully lots of good questions. So as we've heard, we have 1.3 million septic systems in Michigan, uh, which are contributing to approximately 260 million gallons of sewage being regenerated or recycled back into our environment every day. Um, and 20% of those are estimated to be failing, which is contributing to over 50 million gallons of improperly treated sewage being reintroduced into the environment daily. Um, we already heard the risks and the signs of failing septic systems. So some of this I'm going to continue to breeze through. Um, but obviously you hear those numbers and you think, well, why aren't we fixing all of these? And as we know, some of us and some of us not, they're very expensive. Um, and not only is replacing a new uh, subject system, a new experience for most homeowners, but it's really, it can be really challenging and really stressful. Uh, the average cost of a septic system replacement ranges from ten to $30,000 in some cases. And currently one in four Americans are reporting that they have less than $1,000 in a savings account. So right there, you can see there's a disconnect or, or a gap in this um, industry with this need for improved infrastructure and a lack of available resources for Michigan homeowners. So we uh, at Eagle in the Onsite Wastewater Management unit recognized this need and began sort of having these conversations and collaborations with counterparts um, all across the country who have similar programs or who are interested in developing similar programs um, and started working to bring a solution to Michigan and thus the birth of the septic replacement loan program or SRLP as you may hear me refer to it as. So uh, the Michigan legislature appropriated $35 million for our unit to develop and implement a loan program to replace failing and near failing septic systems statewide. So this is a, a statewide program. Uh, Eagle then contracted with Green Bank Lender Michigan Saves to help us develop the program. And we offer uh, two tiered financing options. We have an income-based loan, that's the tier one, and then a market-based loan, that's the tier two. So a brief timeline, back in 2023, Eagle officially contracted with and introduced Michigan Saves and this concept of septic replacement loan program. We then began working with local health departments to develop a set of program minimum standards. So there are um, a standardized set of construction criteria, construction and design criteria that are required to be eligible for this program. And then we started recruiting contractors to participate and install within the program, and we officially launched May 21st of this year, so just a, a few months ago now. So like I mentioned, there are a set of call, they're called program minimum standards. They're a standardized design criteria that in order to be eligible for financing through the SRLP um, permits need to meet. And that is a, I think now 22 page document in, it, in its entirety. So I always encourage people to go to Eagle's website and if they want some light bedtime reading, check that out. But it uh, has minimum isolation distances to groundwater, minimum isolation distances to surface water, um, some additional standardized design criteria and 
really the um, goal or the purpose of these is to be protective of both public and environmental health and assure that the systems that we're funding through this program are not only going to last a long time, but they're going to um, protect people and the great resources of Michigan. So some general provisions of these loans, um, these are unsecured personal loans for individuals owning residential dwellings. They are for sites with a documented failing, near failing or non-existent septic system. And that is to be determined by the regulating local health department staff only. So if you think you have a septic system that's failing or near failing, um, we need the health department to confirm that it is in fact at that point before you would be eligible for financing. Um, and then replacement systems must be evaluated, permitted, and installed in accordance with the program minimum standards. So some eligible costs for these projects include evaluation of system, design, pumping, and installation. Um, permit or engineering fees are also eligible, but based on the workflow, which we'll cover later in this presentation, um, that would need the contractor involved would need to agree to pay that permit cost up front and then loop it into the financing uh, later in the process. So some things that are not eligible for funding through this program include uh, lagoons, dry wells, cisterns, any new construction or new builds, uh, restoration services. So those aeration services and signs that we see along the highway, um, those are not eligible. Replacement of existing municipal sewer connections. So if you're somebody who's on municipal sewer and you need to replace your sewer line, that is not eligible. If you live in an area where sewer is available and you're, you ha currently have a septic system that has failed and are now being required to connect into that existing sewer, that is now eligible for funding through this program. That's a new addition um, into our eligibility requirements. And then pump and haul systems are not eligible or holding tanks. So I I'm briefly mentioned authorized contractors a few slides ago, and what that is is any contractor wishing to install systems within the loan program must register as an authorized contractor through Michigan Saves. Um, this QR code at the bottom takes you to that page, but uh, that is a rolling process. It's happening currently. As of today, actually, this number is outdated already. We have over 78 contractors who are fully, fully authorized statewide and over 50 applications that are still being reviewed and processed. Um, this is a free, it's free for contractors to register. It requires that they send proof of business liability insurance and that they watch a training video that was developed by Michigan Saves and Eagle to make sure that they're just familiar with the program and the process and the program minimum standards. So it's pretty quick and easy for contractors. And the ones that I've worked with thus far in the program have had really great things to say about it. So if you know a local contractor that you really like or you really think that they do great work, um, encourage them to check it out. And Michigan Saves on their website also has this really great map, um, which is the picture on this slide, where you can see contractor coverage. So you can look in your area um, or anywhere that you're just curious to see if there's any contractors available. And then when you click on those pins, it will give you that contractor's contact information. So it's kind of cool to play around with. So um, now we're gonna dive into some loan info. So the tier one, that's again, the income qualified loan. The requirements for that are to meet the income um, criteria and the lender does require proof of income at time of application. So those numbers are right here on the screen. They change annually. Um, so this is for 2024 still. And then loan structure, unsecured personal loan, there's no lien or collateral required, loan amounts of one to $30,000. It is a locked interest rate of 1% with loan terms up to 10 years. And then the tier two, again, that's the market-based loan. So this is for the homeowners that don't qualify for the tier one, meaning they don't meet those income requirements. Um, Again, unsecured personal loan with no lien or collateral required. The loan amounts on this one are a little bit different. It's one to $50,000. And these are fixed interest rates that vary by lender. So right now the lowest interest rate is 7.5%, um, but that changes as the market changes. And so the process to apply um, before applying for a loan, you, a homeowner would need to obtain that local health department construction permit that has been permitted in accordance with those program minimum standards. So just how it, how you would do now and, and just how we just heard, the first thing you're going to do is call your local health department and say, I think I need a new septic system. Um, 
from there, you would go on to Michigan Saves website and look at that authorized contractor list and select the authorized contractor that you want to work with. Or as I mentioned, if you have somebody that you really like and you really want to work with and they're not authorized, we just need to get them authorized, which again is pretty quick and painless. They will then look at the permit and write up a bid. Once you have a bid from the contractor that you agree to that price, then you complete your loan application online. Um, so you would enter all of your normal you know, financing application information that the lender is asking for. And the lender, in many cases, will reach out for additional information such as proof of income. So for the tier two folks, um, they find out about loan approval or denial almost immediately. Usually it's within just a couple of hours. And for tier one, I've, it's about three to five business days just because we do need to verify that proof of income. So sometimes tracking that down and then taking a look at it takes a little bit longer. So progress to date, we, since launching May 21st, we have over 200 loan applications that we've received. Um, 47 systems have been fully installed, approved by local health department staff and funded. And we have over $1.6 million in approved loans. So I did the math yesterday. And as of right now, with the 47 installations, that comes out to about 17,000 gallons of sewage a day that's being reintroduced into the environment and now treated properly, which is, to me, awesome. Um, if you're interested in more information about the program, Michigan Saves website is definitely the place to go. And I've linked it here. There's a lot of great just general information. Um, their customer service line is to K Katie and Chrissy are amazing. So you call and you talk to one of them and they have really become experts in the septic space and can answer all of your questions. And I also am readily available to answer any questions that, that you may have about the process or about contractors um, or if your health department has um, questions about the program minimum standards, any of that stuff, I would definitely be the contact for that. So please feel free to reach out. And that's the end of me. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think we're going to open it up for questions. Yeah, we are. <clears throat> so thank you, Anne and Andrew and Stu for sharing your information. Um, one thing I wanted to ask before moving on to general questions from the group is um, I wanted to add that with our Ottawa Conservation District um, watershed restoration programs with our septic assistance, um, there are potentially some other restrictions as to who can use our funding, such as there is a particular um, restrictions on folks who are directly on a lake shore. So unfortunately, if you are directly on an inland lake shore, um, we are unable to fund you through our grant program just because of the way the non-point source program works and where they want the money to go. And so Anne had told me before this presentation that there is no such restriction on the septic loan program specifically as far as if you're on a lake shore or not. So that's a benefit between there. Um, and then also, Anne, I guess this is maybe a question for you if you want to add any input. Um, Ottawa County is uh, different than other counties because not every county has um, additional septic assistance uh, like we do here at the Conservation District. Um, it, we, we apply through these 319 non-point source program grants through the state and not everyone gets them. So fortunately here in Ottawa County, we have additional financial assistance available in addition to the new state uh, septic loans. Um, and are there any issues with someone potentially utilizing funding from both of our programs um, to help cover anything that maybe isn't covered? Um, and then maybe what would be the best way, do you think, of someone utilizing both systems if they wanted to? Like, say, if they're eligible for $10,000 through our program, could they get the additional covered by you? And how would you think the best way about to go about that would be? 100%. I encourage support. Love that. I wish more counties had that sort of supplemental support available. Um, I would say if somebody thinks that they're eligible for your funding, um, to reach out to you guys first, reach out to your office first, find out what you know, you guys can help with or assist with. And then at that point, we've had a lot of homeowners who do sort of partial for the loan. So they've either saved 5,000, but they need seven. So then they get a $2,000 loan or, you know, however they want to work it out. So whatever they can't cover or whatever you guys can't cover, then they could apply, um, use that for their application with the loan program. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then one thing I also wanted to mention about the Ottawa Conservation District funding is that 
ours is not a loan. We're not gonna ask for you to give the money back, but just a note that it is also still taxable. So you will re receive a, a 1099 at the uh, during tax season. So there's that little caveat to keep in mind as well. Um, looks like I received our first question in the chat. So feel free if you wanna put your questions in the chat or um, you can also use the raise your hand function or even just turn on your um, video if you're not sure where that function is. And I will um, kind of go ahead and have people ask their questions as they are there. So Brock asked the question, um, is there anything to add to septic tanks to help the system digest the solids? Um, would any of our, say, Sue or I guess anyone, yeah, Anne, if you want to answer I'll answer. answer. That. We just did a septic smart webinar at Eagle. So we got a lot of this kind of question. Um, no, these systems will work naturally on their own. So you don't need to add any of the additives that we see all the time on the shelves saying, you know, support your septic system or make it better. Um, none of that is necessary. All that you need to put in is your natural waste and it will work um, perfectly on its own. Anyone else have anything to add to that answer? Okay, great. Um, any other questions that anyone has? Oh, got another comment. So um, Nancy asked, uh, can you comment on companies who offer drain field maintenance? Is it worthwhile? So anyone uh, who would like to answer that question? Hey, I guess I'll, I'll jump in on that one. And when I hear drain field maintenance, I don't, I'd like that defined a little bit. Um, if we're talking about, um, I, I think uh, Ann touched on it, you know, there's some uh, systems out there where they um, inject air or they break up some of the biomat and things like that. Um, do, do we have recommendations? We don't recommend any anybody um, or companies or anything like that. The maintenance really comes in the in the septic tank, getting things pumped out and keeping things clean, making sure you have baffles on your septic system. Um, the cleaner the water going out into your drain field, the better the system. Stu, I, I know gonna, one of. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, I was just going to piggyback that, piggyback on that, and say it's also what you're putting into it. You know, making sure that you're following the septic safe items that can actually go into your septic tank, because a lot of time issue is what you're putting into it. So would you guys say that um, once a drain field is like plugged, I know that's something that we ask on our um, ranking questions is if there, is there any plugging or issues happening in the drain field? Like once that occurs, is there really any way to fix that? Or is that something that once that those issues occur, um, you kind of need them to be replaced? Um, so if if the drain field um, has, uh, if it's it's developed a biomass and and you know it's no longer uh, draining water away, and you put in a new septic system, we usually like to to have two of them, and we split them with a diverter valve, and we let that old system sit. And over time, the bacteria is naturally going to you know break down the biomass. It's uh, you know, going to rejuvenate itself. Um, the the problem there is a lot of systems are root bound, and and those types of systems are not normally going to regenerate themselves. Um, those roots are in there, they're woody material, and they're they're not going to break down like a biomat is. So um, I kind of hope that answers the, the question there. Um, if, mm -hmm. if it's a well-designed drain field, some of them that we go to are in the water table. And so seasonally they're getting, you know, water into the, the bottom of the drain field. Those we just have to abandon and go with the new drain field. Gotcha. So really prevention is the best thing and make sure you're taking care of it. <clears throat> um, Nancy had a follow-up question of what should she expect to pay for a routine tank pump out? I can speak, at least in my area, I'm in Ingham County. So maybe the Ottawa County folks should cut me off. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, average here is four to $600, depending on tank size, location, whether or not the pumper needs to dig it up or if there are risers, so there's no digging required. There's a few factors that kind of affect where you fall on that range, but most fall between that four and $600. Okay, Stu and Andrew, would you say that's about the same for Ottawa? That's very similar, I'd say they, might give you a hundred bucks off if you dig it out because they don't want to dig it out. So if you if you find it for them, they'll they'll reward you. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, 
Well, not currently seeing any. So, oh, one more. Here we go. All right. Matt Bain asked, um, one lab at the GBSU campus is using IDEX to test for E. coli. What method did AWRI use for you? Um, ben, you might be good to answer this a little bit more. I do know that they tested for, it was microbial source tracking. Um, and I know Ben worked with the, the, the guy who kind of put that system together a bit more than I did. So I don't know if you want to add any information as to what method they used. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not a biologist, so I don't really want to speak <laughs> for, for them, uh, in that, in that regard, but I could get that answer certainly, but. Mm -hmm. I believe the guy who, um, put that system together, didn't he do a, a thesis research paper and, um, talk about the microbial source tracking and how they identified the uh, different DNAs in there? Yeah, they did. You yeah. could probably share that thesis so that you guys can read up a little bit more on, um, kind of how that method works. All right, any final lingering questions? I had two more quick ones if nobody else has anything. Yeah, go ahead. You can just say them out loud, Matt. What well, um so for the uh if the the information that Andrew uh put forward um for the if so if the statewide um septic code goes through you said if someone's septic system was failing, they'd have six months to replace it. What uh, if someone were to have, uh, like, if the health department were to go to a home now and they found a sept a failing septic system, how much time does someone have to replace it now? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So right now, if we went due to a, like a complaint, say your neighbor said, "Hey, I smell something funky from my neighbor, my other my neighbor's yard." And I can't tell what it is, but you can guys go check it out. We'd we'd go and look and we'd work with the homeowner and say, like, um, we'd give them what's called is is a correction order if we see like an actual health hazard, like an imminent health threat, because uh your uh, fecal matter can contain like viruses and bacteria that can make you know kids sick or people sick. So we would give them like a certain time frame um to correct that. And as long as they're meeting those steps then we wouldn't issue fines. Now, if the, if the homeowner or person said, you know what, I'm not doing any of this, then we might we might do a fine. So we still have can do that on a county level too, but we don't go out um, every five years to a, anybody's septic system. It's usually driven by either the real estate transfer program or by a complaint driven. I hope that answers that. Ooh, Matt looks like you're muted. One issue that um, someone had gotten a hold of me and was saying um, they didn't have any indication that their septic was failing, uh, so they weren't necessarily going to get it checked. And I think their concern was, though, if they had someone check it, so if someone checks it and finds that it is failing, do they have to report them? And in that case, then are they on the hook to get that replaced, like within a certain time frame? Or is that if they get it checked by someone, is that still kept private? I heard they had to report it to the health department. So I, I can kind of speak to that from our program's perspective. Um, we try to keep things confidential as, as long as possible, right? So if there's a landowner that's on the fence of whether or not they want to move forward with the program, they don't really know the condition of their system, uh, they don't know exactly what's going on um, just yet. We do, uh, you know, sometimes encourage them to work with contractors to come out and do an inspection and, and take a look at the system and kind of give them a layout of, of where they're kind of at uh, prior to getting the health department and other organizations involved. Um, it, whether or not we will report that person, you know, we we always try to keep our, our programs confidential uh as as long as possible so i i can tell you from the 10 years we've been doing this we have we have never directly reported a landowner um whether or not there would ever be a situation where we would kind of legally and ethically have to do that if we saw a cheater pipe leading directly from um you know a home you know right into the creek or you know a situation that was really really bad you know i i, I can't sit here and say that there's never going to be a situation where where we might have to report someone but it's it's never happened in the 10 years i've been here 
yeah, from the OCD standpoint, we uh, try to work with the landowners as much as we can and help them out and be able to be a resource that they can go to without, um, you know, fear of being reported. You know, if we see that someone is trying to do what they can and maybe just don't have the financial ability to do something, you know, we, we're not, we're not going to want to um, report them, but we do try to work with them and try to help them figure out ways that they could um, deal with the issue, at least from our standpoint. I think one last question I had, when you brought up the sampling data for, when you were talking about the sampling weeks that you did, mm -hmm. um, what see what season was that was that summer that you were doing that or i believe both times ben were more kind of late summer fall yeah late summer fall i mean typically we would do our e coli um you know august through september ish sometimes leading into october um i know eagles window of when they want to kind of cut off that e coli testing is the end of october so so obviously we would we would stop it before then but uh yeah i'd say usually august september did and we you... do try to get a kind of like a wet weather sample and a dry weather sample. Yeah, so... yeah, we we always we always, you know, the the goal was five straight weeks of of sampling, but um we would go out additional days if we needed to get another wet weather sample or whatever. So we, we always wanted to make sure there was a, a a good representative sample of the weather in that time period and and that we had plenty of dry and wet samples. On the graphs that you showed, I did you um end up separating your data where you could look at it like how what was the difference were you seeing it you know spike from runoff or were you seeing it just in general because i noticed obviously some you were always above a certain threshold but some of those places yeah. were were very high mm -hmm. yeah yeah and we you know we would definitely correspond that to weather events um and uh yeah i mean there's it's tough, right? I mean, E. coli sampling, it's its always just a snapshot in time, and there's always going to be unknowns as to why it's high. You know, there, there were times when, um, you know, when we did Deer Creek sampling, um, there were sudden spikes just south of, of town itself, right? Not even in agricultural areas um, during dry times where it would suddenly spike really, really high, and we didn't know if it was maybe a sewer overflow or a situation like that so there's always those those unknowns but we do try to like look at that data and and kind of correlate that with weather events and other things that we're seeing in the field as well so okay <clears throat> any other questions from anyone in the group thank you matt for your questions I think at this, at this time, if you want to ask any questions, you can kind of just unmute and ask. Otherwise, if there's no other questions, I think that will end things off a little early. Um, again, this re this meeting has been recorded, so we are I'm going to be working on posting this uh, online tomorrow, so you can kind of come back and check things out and see if there's anything you missed. And um, uh, I'll also send a follow-up email with contacts and all that good stuff. So thank you everyone for attending and thank you for your good questions and um, have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.